thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. I'm going to be as brief as I can. You all know the situation you face and the world faces with massive environmental degradation, desertification, megafires and climate change. You're all aware that the youth of today in many countries are agitated and angry and demanding that political leaders, world leaders, take action. But as I know, as a former president of a political party, politicians don't know what to do and can only take the advice of their advisors. Now, what advice are the political leaders of the world getting? We've had 25 conferences on climate, COP1 to COP25. And as you've seen, no advice of any clarity has come out of those. All we have seen is chaos and confusion and not a word virtually about industrial agriculture playing a major role in climate change in every country. Not through any wisdom, almost by accident, I became very concerned with massive environmental degradation 65 years ago as a 20 year old scientist joining a government service as a biologist. What I became concerned with when we didn't have the buzzwords, desertification, biodiversity loss, climate change, was the loss of biodiversity, soil erosion and degradation that I was seeing in the wildest parts of Africa, where we were setting aside beautiful areas as future national parks. I became very concerned that we professional people did not know what we were doing, nor how to stop it, nor what was causing it. We could not blame cattle, corporate greed, anything else. These were wild areas of Africa. I worked with some of the best ecologists in the world and none of us had solutions. That began the dedication of my life to trying to understand and find some solution to that. If I fast forward 20 years later, we had discovered what was causing desertification, but not yet the whole of the picture and we were getting exciting results. If I fast forward beyond that to 1984, by that time, I was a political exile in America and was commissioned by the US Department of Agriculture to put 2000 scientists through training. In a new management framework, I was developing to, develop, to address the complexity involved. With the help of those 2000 scientists, we finally broke through in 1984 uh, with understanding both the cause and the remedy of one aspect of the problem, desertification. If we come forward to now, in the succeeding years, we have been facing denial that humans were causing climate change, where we had never had denial that we were causing desertification over more than 10,000 years. Recently, the majority of sane scientists in the world have acknowledged that humans are causing climate change. To that, there is only one possible interpretation. If humans are causing it, then it is not being caused by fossil fuels, livestock, and all the things we're blaming. It is being caused by our management. And that happens to be the exact same management that was causing desertification over the last 10,000 years. Now, I cannot explain all of this that is in the third edition of my textbook and has taken 65 years of work. But you can follow up and gain knowledge about it. All I can give you in the short time I'm allotted is some highlights and a way forward. What we make and what we produce, I want to distinguish from what we manage. We make and produce 
masses of things, art, literature, cities, bridges, roads, space vehicles. We produce masses of food, soybeans, beef, grain. All of these things we make or produce do not involve complexity. They all stop if we stop making them or producing them. They stop if a battery runs out, fuel runs out, anything of that sort. We make or produce those, we do not manage those. There are only three things humans manage, and it is management that is causing climate change. The three things that we manage are ourselves. We manage our lives, our organizations, our communities. We manage nature, from which we produce food and energy, whether it be atomic or solar or coal or oil, and we manage economies. You do not make humans, organizations, nature, or economy, those you manage. All of those are self-regenerating, self-managing in a way. If people die, the organization continues, families continue. If we lose hundreds of species, the environment, nature continues, but in changed form. And economies continue, as I have learned, even when an entire economy and currency collapses, the economy of the country that I live in was kept going by the black market, which was actually more honest and had more integrity than the mainstream economy. But these things are things we manage. When we look at management, it occurs at two levels. Everybody listening to me now and myself, we can manage our own families. We can choose to ride a bicycle to work, to change the light bulbs. We can manage small communities, our families. That's the human scale of managing. When we manage at a large scale, the whole of Chile, the whole of Uruguay, Argentina, Zimbabwe, America, when we manage at that scale, it cannot be done by the individual. That management is done by institutions, human organizations, mainly by governments through laws, taxation, subsidies, regulations, etc., that dictate management. That is the institutional level of management. Now remember, we manage institutions, nature and economy, all of which are complex. Now, when we get to the things that we make, when things go wrong, we can put them right. Problems are not difficult to solve. When it comes to the things we manage that are complex, problems are described in system science as wicked meaning almost impossible to solve. It took us over 10,000 years to solve the problem of desertification and understand it was not being caused by livestock, but by management. That's an example. Now, when we uh, manage at the levels I've said, the human scale and the institutional scale, both are causing desertification, but climate change and desertification uh, and, and climate change is coming almost entirely from management at the government scale. It is being caused by the policies of every single government in the world, rather than by individuals who cannot develop policy. So we have two policies that need to be looked at very, very closely, agriculture and energy policies. How do we produce our food from nature and how do we produce energy from nature when we have to do it through institutions that we're managing, which are complex, from nature that is complex and in economies that are complex and when the only economy in the world that can support a, support a nation has to be based on the photosynthetic process. 
the end of the day, you have to eat food. Nothing is possible without agriculture. Now, when we look at this situation, I do not give doomsday talks. I would not be talking to you unless there was great hope. I regret not having the time to go into it in detail, but where the people and young people are demanding action from our political leaders, they are absolutely correct. Every human in the world should be demanding action. We should have put this on a war footing decades ago. Now, what are political leaders to do? Not a single political leader knows what to do. They can only rely on their advisors. And as I said earlier, if you look at the scientific advice, it is coming from people trained in narrow areas of expertise on things that we produce. There are no experts in how to manage the complexity of institutions, nature, and economies together, simultaneously a complexity that is probably beyond human understanding forever. But that happens to be something that we've been working on for 65 years with the help of thousands of scientists in institutions that were opposing the work. So what I would like to suggest to you is the same suggestion I've been making to many others and I would give to any politician thinking as though I was still president of a political party as I once was and knowing how politicians develop policies and that they cannot take political risk. I would suggest that to your government, the head of your government, that you simply carry on policies as you are doing today. Those policies are developed by your politicians with advice from interest and pressure groups and from experts in agricultural production, food, etc. But not in how to deal with complexity. I would suggest that your government, while doing that concurrently at the same time, forms a small policy task force, acts in a statesmanlike manner, not in a political manner, puts this above politics, and has this small force thoroughly investigate everything I am saying to you today about addressing the cause of desertification and climate change, which is exactly the same in Chile as it is in every nation in the world. I think if you do this investigation that I'm suggesting to you, you will find that it is entirely possible for your political leaders to develop policy in a national holistic context. What every Chilean wants based on your culture, your society, your needs and tied to your life supporting environment as it will have to be hundreds of years from now if your descendants are able to live a life like that. Truly regenerating your economy, your environment, your communities and everything else. I believe you will find how relatively easy it is for you Chileans to be able to do that. I wish you well in your conference and I thank you for the opportunity of talking to you.